Well, like we have mentioned already this morning, we have the joy of celebrating Jesus' victorious resurrection. The resurrection of our Lord and our Savior on this Easter Sunday. I think Kevin may have mentioned it, or I think Kevin mentioned it. We, We have the privilege of doing this each and every Sunday, right? This is not something new for us, like we just somehow once a year remember that, oh yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. Right, Every Lord's Day, we gather together and we remember and we celebrate our risen Savior. But this morning, it's, it's that time that we have once a year to just kind of pause and reflect a little deeper on what that truth means for our lives as believers. And so we've actually been doing that for the last three weeks, this being our fourth, as we have been walking through 1 Corinthians 15. We've looked already at the resurrection's proof. We've seen the resurrection's significance. And last week, the resurrection's body. And now this week, as we close this wonderful chapter, we're going to see Paul focus in on the resurrection's victory. So we come to this passage asking this question. If Jesus rose from the dead, which he has, which Paul has been making clear throughout this chapter, what does that mean for us as humanity? What does the future reality of the resurrection of believers say about the present circumstances and the future prospects for us as God's people? In this final passage, Paul is going to answer these questions by framing it within the language, within the context of victory. This is a concept that we're all familiar with, aren't we? This concept of victory. We typically reserve this these conversations for official contests or battles or sporting events. We talk about the back-to-back national championship victories of the Georgia Bulldogs in football. Right, Charlie? That was just for you, bud. Yeah. <laughs> we think about Brooks Kepka hopefully eyeing his first Masters victory this afternoon in the Masters. We think about this in the context of war as well. As Sir Winston Churchill once declared in his May 1940 speech this, you ask, what is our policy? I can say it is to wage war by sea, land, and air with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalog of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer with one word, victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory, however long and hard the road may be, for without victory, there is no survival. You see, victory presumes two things, doesn't it? Victory first presumes that there is an adversary. There is an enemy. It might be other people, co-workers, friends, whatever. It might be a power structure, the man, capitalism, whatever it might be. It might be yourself, personal limits, bad habits, victory over those things, you name it. But victory presumes that there is some sort of adversary, some sort of enemy to gain victory over. And secondly, victory presumes that it's better to win than to lose. Right? Given the either or choice, who among us would ever choose to lose? Now, certainly there are some of us who are more competitive than others. Some of you who know me well, especially several years ago in the context of the youth group, will know that I am one who is often quite competitive. Right, but even if you are not one of those as competitive, competitive as me or others, we would all still choose to win, all things being equal. Well, this morning we are going to see Paul speak of an ultimate battle. An ultimate battle with an ultimate adversary and with an ultimate stakes of winning or losing. And in so doing, we're going to see Paul answer these three questions that I hope will guide our time walking through these verses. Why do we need victory? How do we get victory? And what does this victory look like? Well, let's begin by looking at our passage, reading it in full. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. 
Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. As we think about this concept of victory in this passage, we come to our first question, which is why do we need victory? Why do we need victory? Well, Paul begins this passage by setting up a number of, of contrast for us. Flesh and blood cannot inherit, only the imperishable can. We shall not all fall asleep, but we shall all be changed. He sets up a number of these contrasts, and here as he begins in verse 50, the point of verse 50 is to lay out for us why this victory is needed in the first place. Look back at what he says in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. When Paul uses this language here of flesh and blood and the kingdom of God, he's referring to sort of this world as opposed to that world. The the way things are is opposed to the way things will be. The perishable is opposed to the imperishable. And Paul's making it clear here in this opening verse that as it stands, In your earthly, physical, sin-ridden, sin-decayed body and nature, you are unable to enter in to the perfect, imperishable kingdom of God. Now, he's not saying here that physical bodies will not inherit the kingdom of God. If he were saying that, that would contradict the entire point of the chapter, the entire argument of the chapter that he has been making. Remember, as he has been arguing that just as Christ was raised, so too will we be raised. So he's not making the point here that physicality cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He's making the point that mortal flesh that is fallen because of sin cannot, unless changed, inherit the kingdom of God. You see, Paul is reminding us here of the truth that God's word makes from the beginning to the end, and a truth that is especially clear in the New Testament. This is that truth of God's word that each and every one of us, as, creator, as, 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 as creation, as created men and women, each and every one of us are sinners. We are sinners both by nature, that is because of our union with Adam in the fall, and also by choice. And because of our sin, because of our rebellion against God, we will all receive the wages for that sin, which is death. If you remember back to the very beginning of God's word, the very beginning of creation, death was not part of God's original design, was it? Death was not part of what God originally created. God creates Adam and Eve. He creates trees and the animals and everything in creation as as good. And he gives Adam and Eve a clear command of what to do and what not to do and the consequences for what will happen if they sin against him. But this death was not part of his original plan. But because of their disobedience, because of their rebellion against their creator, death enters into the world. And from that that very moment when death entered into the world with Adam and Eve, death has reigned as our greatest enemy from that time a thousand, thousands of years ago unto this very day. And C.S. Lewis once said it like this, 100% of us die and the percentage cannot be increased. Now, that's exactly right, isn't it? Try hard as our culture may to escape death, to escape the power of death, to escape the effects of death, they are unable. 
Death is our greatest enemy, and we will all ultimately die. Listen, that is the grave reality of God's word. And again, the reason that there is this yearning in humanity to defeat death, to defy death, is because, like we said, death is not natural. It is not part of God's design for us. It is not part of God's intention for us. We fight against it because it is our ultimate enemy. In every old myth, in every old legend, in every old story from whatever century, from whatever culture, you will always see death as being talked about as something unnatural and something in enmity against humanity. One author puts it like this. Death is always traumatic. Death is obscene. It is counter to everything that is living. Death is ugly, painful, sad, brutal, and terrible. It is an aberration. It is terrifying. Death is absolutely not natural. It is monstrous. It does not give you any options. Death is immutable in that sense. So as we think about the resurrection's victory here in this passage, we begin by asking this question, why do we need victory? Well, why do we need victory? Because we have an ultimate enemy, and that ultimate enemy is death. And so each and every one of us then have to decide whether or not we believe that death will ultimately win in the end. You see, if you believe that death will ultimately win in the end, then why fight? Why strive? Right? Enjoy your life as you see fit, because once it's gone, it's gone. That's the point that Paul made a couple passages ago, right? Let's eat, drink, and be merry, because we die and it is all over. But if you believe, as I do, that death does not win in the end, then what is the basis for that belief? If victory over death is possible then how can that victory be obtained? Well, that leads to our second question this morning, which is how do we get victory? And to understand how we get victory over death, we first have to understand the source of death's power. We first have to understand the source of death's power. Look at verse 56. Paul tells us that the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. First, he says the sting of sin is death. As I mentioned a moment ago, death entered the world through sin. Right? Without sin, death has no power. But because of sin, death reigns. Now, the word that Paul uses here for sting was a word that was often used to refer to uh, the sting of a bee or a scorpion. With, without sin, death has no means of stinging the human race. But everyone has been stung because everyone is a sinner. And one author puts it like this, Sin is the instrument of death, and death is the needle with sin as its poison. And then he tells us that the power of sin is the law. So if death is the needle with sin as its poison, the law is then that environment in which that poison spreads throughout all humanity. Now, there's two approaches to the law that we often find that ignore this problem of death. On the one hand, people ignore the law and just go headlong against the law because people and sinners are lawbreakers, right? In God's word, it's clear that the law is righteous and the law is God-given by nature. The law points us to what is good. It points us to what is right. But because it points us to what is righteous, because it points us to what is good, and because we are by nature unrighteous, the law really does nothing other than expose our sin and expose our unrighteousness for what it really is. Romans 7, I encourage you to go read that passage in full, perhaps this afternoon, as you think about and meditate on this concept of the law and sin. But Romans 7 is one of those passages where Paul outlines his theology of the law as it relates to sin in probably the deepest and most important way in God's Word. But just listen to what he says here in Romans 7, beginning 
in verse 7. As we think like this, we begin to ask the question in our mind, well, does that mean that the law is bad? Or does that mean that the law itself is evil? Does that mean that the law itself causes me to sin? That's sort of the questions behind Paul's answer here in Romans 7. He says, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. Then he ends the passage in verse 11 and 12. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So you see, Paul doubles down here, makes it clear the law is good, the law is holy, the law is righteous. But sin being what it is, and we being sinners as we are, the law only serves to highlight our sin all the more and show our nature all the more and put our law breaking on display all the more. And so some hardened by sin, hardened by their rebellion against God, embrace this all the more and just run headlong into law breaking licentiousness in their life. Now on the other extreme, some try to trust in the law thinking that following the law, following the rules, will enable them to defeat death on their own. That's the other side of the pendulum. This approach tries to find something in the law that the law cannot provide. Listen, if you are seeking to provide, to find justification in the law, you will be sorely disappointed. If you are seeking to find reconciliation with God through following a list of commands, you will find no reconciliation whatsoever. And what most often happens in this approach is that because man-made laws are easier to keep, these sort of man-made laws are highlighted and catapulted to the top of the list so that you can keep those, check those off, and feel a little good about yourself, think you're a little more holy, a little more righteous than you actually are. But if you truly seek to keep the law, to keep the law of God down to every last jot and tittle, you will find very quickly that you are wholly unable to do so. And you will find yourself on the side of the rest of humanity, condemned by the law and deserving of God's eternal wrath as the lawbreaker that you are. So how then do we get victory over this enemy? How do we get victory over this ultimate enemy? If we can't secure the victory ourselves, because we're sinners, we can't. If the law cannot provide that victory, because the law only serves to expose and highlight our sin all the more, then how do we get, how do we secure such a victory? We'll look back to our passage beginning in verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Paul begins here by saying, behold, I I, I tell you a mystery. He's saying, look, listen, listen up. I have new information about the future. Up until this time, these things have been hidden from us. But listen, I'm going to explain it to you very clearly. And he's telling us here that something must happen outside of us. A change must occur. The dead must be raised by someone else, he's saying here. They cannot raise themselves. The perishable must put on the imperishable, and that comes from outside of themselves. And this change happens in in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet which is Paul using Old Testament imagery that's used to describe the last day. And when this happened, Paul says, then will come to pass the Old Testament prophecies from Isaiah 23 and Hosea 13. That's what he quotes here at the end of verse 54 and in verse 55, sort of a combination of these two passages as Paul sings this mockery song of death. 
death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? You see, Paul is singing the victory song in mockery of death because death's defeat has been secured. He's, he's at the end of the game singing, we are the champions, right? No one sings that song unless victory is 100% in the bag, right? No one wants to be found in the fourth quarter, you're up by 14 or so, starting to sing, we are the champions, only to find out that they have made a last minute comeback and you look like a fool, right? No one sings that unless the victory is 100% secure. And that's the case here with death, as Paul considers the future resurrection of those in Christ. Death is not simply erased of his power. It is literally swallowed up, never to be seen again. And what is the basis for Paul's confidence? What is the basis for him declaring defeat over death as he looks forward to the future, as he looks forward to that moment when we will be raised imperishable, when we will be changed in a moment? We'll look at verse 57. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the victory is already secured because Jesus has already defeated death. Jesus was killed. Jesus was buried. But the grave could not hold him. He arose from the dead, and in his arising from the dead, he deals the death blow to death itself. I love how one author puts it when he writes this. The victory is already secure in Christ because the king of the kingdom, kingdom took on flesh and blood. The imperishable one became perishable on our behalf. The immortal one became mortal on behalf of the sinner he wanted to save by absorbing the sting of death. Its venom has been absorbed by Christ and drained of its potency so that the victory over death belongs to God and to God's people who benefit from it. Amen. Listen, Christ is victorious over death. Paul says in Romans 6, 9, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. In fact, 2 Timothy 1, 10, Paul says that he has abolished death. He speaks of Christ Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And not only has he abolished death, not only has he defeated death, he's also taken the very power of sin, away the very power of sin by fulfilling the law on our behalf. He has, Galatians 3.13, redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And in so doing, he has replaced the reign of sin with the reign of grace. And he did all of this so that Paul could declare in verse 57 and elsewhere, thanks be to God who gives us the victory in the Lord, through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus takes away the power of death by rising from the dead and defeating death itself. There is nothing, there is nothing, not a single thing that you or I as a sinner can do or have to do to defeat death because Jesus has done it for us. Listen, there is no law. There is no amount of following rules. There is nothing that you and I must fulfill, nothing that you or I can fulfill in order to be giving, given imperishability because Jesus has fulfilled the law in our place. The Christian inherits the kingdom of God. The Christian inherits imperishability. The Christian inherits immortality. All of these things we read about in this passage because of the substitutionary and sovereign work of Christ on our behalf. So you ask, how do we get the victory? We get the victory through the finished work of Jesus on our behalf. Listen, this is the good news of the gospel. This is that good news of what Jesus has done to deliver us, to reconcile us, to save us from our sins. This is that good news that we gather week in and week out, Lord's Day in and Lord's Day out, to celebrate and to rehearse and to worship our risen Savior for all that he is. Listen, if you are here with us this morning, if you're visiting with us, perhaps you're here regularly 
Uh, perhaps you're here visiting with family. Perhaps you're here because you, like I did when I grew up, you went to church on Christmas and Easter because that's what you're supposed to do in the South, uh, right? But perhaps you're here and you have no knowledge of this saving work of Jesus on your behalf. Perhaps you have no knowledge of this gospel that we are celebrating and that we are rehearsing. Let me encourage you this morning that this good news is not only good news for those of us who are already believers, this good news is good news for every single person who trusts in the finished work of Christ on their behalf. You you see, the, the reality of God's word that we've talked about already is that each and every one of us, myself included, and every single one of us in this room, every single person ever born, each of us is a sinner separated from our creator because we have sinned against him. And because we have sinned against him, we will receive the just wrath of God poured out on us for our rebellion. And the worst news about that is there is nothing that you can do to atone for that sin. There's no amount of trying to be a good person, no amount of trying to atone for your sin, no amount of trying to fulfill the law. Left alone, you will die as all human beings do because the wages of sin is death and you will face the judgment of God upon your sin and eternal separation from him. Remember, as Paul says in verse 50, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You on your own merits cannot and will not dwell with God for eternity. There is one way and one way only for you to inherit that kingdom, and that is that you would be changed in the twinkling of an eye, that you would receive that immortality, that you would receive that imperishability, and that only happens through faith in Jesus in this life through trusting in him, his finished work on your behalf, trusting in his obedience of the law in your place, his taking that wrath on the cross in his body for you in your place. And so the the command of the gospel is that you would turn from your sin and that you would trust in this good news. If this is something that you have never heard before, if this is something that you've heard a lot, but perhaps this morning you're hearing it with new ears for the first time, I want to urge you, I want to urge you to consider these things this morning. Consider your place before your creator God. Consider what will happen when you die, because you will die. Consider who will pay for your sin. Will you pay for your sin in all eternity in hell? Or will you trust in Jesus in this life to have paid for your sin perfectly and sufficiently on that cross? I urge you this morning, look to Jesus, trust in him, give your life to Jesus this morning. So we've answered these questions so far this morning. Why do we need victory? How do we get victory? One final question as we close our time in God's word this morning is what does this victory look like? This victory not only has future, future promises for us as God's people, which it certainly does, and we've talked about already, but this victory also has present-day implications for us as God's people. This victory is not something that God will give to us only in the future as believers in Christ, but it's something that he gives to us even now in a small measure as followers of Christ. Now listen, this certainly does not mean what so many false teachers in our day mean when they speak of living the, quote, victorious life. If you Google that, don't Google that phrase, actually. Uh, If you were to Google that phrase, you would find a lot of bad teaching. For many false teachers in our day, that victorious life, that living in victory, means that you can and should live a life of victory in the sense of having no financial troubles, no suffering, no physical troubles, and so forth. Listen, that is a foreign concept from God's word. And it is not something that God promises to us in the slightest. Instead, what we have 
is, is the ultimate victory over sin and death that is secured by Christ and possessed by the believer in Christ such that we can walk through this life and we can walk through those sufferings that we will encounter. We will walk through those hardships and trials and tribulations that will come our way knowing that Jesus wins. And knowing that as Jesus wins, so we too will win in the end, as we are in him and as we will share in his victory in the age to come. That's why Paul ends the passage here in verse 58 saying, therefore, therefore, I think this therefore is not only in light of this passage, I think this therefore is in light of this entire chapter. Therefore, in light of everything that I've told you about the resurrection, everything about the resurrection's proof, everything about the resurrection's significance, everything about the resurrection's body that you have to look forward to, everything about the resurrection's victory that you share in. Therefore, in light of all of that, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Listen, we as Christians... We as followers of Christ have the freedom to live this life free from anxiety, that anxiety that keeps us up at night, that anxiety over money and relationships and health, whatever it may be in your life, because our hope and our motivation for steadfastness in this life is not winning in an earthly sense, but is the winning of Christ. We don't have to be moved by the things that normally would throw us off course when we're focused on winning on our own. We can rest in the finished work of Jesus in our stead and on our behalf. It's it's like watching a football game that we already know the outcome of, right? We can enjoy it. We can pay attention to some of the minor details that we might have missed in the stress of watching that game Live, We can watch without anxiety or fear because we already know the outcome. Listen, brothers and sisters, as we consider our own lives, our own trials, our own tribulations that we face, we can approach this life in that very same way because you and I already know the outcome. Jesus wins, and we will share in that victory. Jesus has paid for our sins. Jesus has risen from the dead. Jesus has delivered the death blow to sin, to Satan, and to death. And Jesus will one day return to fully and to finally save his people from their sin, to fully and finally defeat death, defeat sin, defeat Satan, and to fully and finally usher in his kingdom for all of eternity. I want to ask you to turn with me to Romans chapter 8 as we close our time this morning. Romans chapter 8 at the end is one of my favorite passages in Scripture, period. But it's certainly one of my favorite passages in Scripture as we consider this rock-solid hope that we have in Christ's victory and in Christ's love for us, and therefore our victory in him. Look at Romans chapter 8 beginning in verse 31. I want to read them through the end. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's it's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And then you have these beautiful, wonderful promises here in verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. We are victorious through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, brothers and sisters, this is the hope that we have this Easter Sunday. 
This is the resurrection's victory that each and every one of us this morning are invited to partake of. Rest in this hope. Rest in this victory. Rest in Jesus as your victorious resurrection Savior and King. And as you rest in that finished work of Jesus for you on your behalf, you are freed, as Paul says there at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, to pursue the work that God has called you to, knowing that your work, knowing that your ministry has eternal significance. So rest in his victory. And as you do so, as Paul ends the chapter, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen. Let's go to the Lord now in prayer.